Welcome to the Myth, Legend, and Lore podcast. Ancient rites, traditions, and festivals can be an exciting and thought-provoking subject to talk about. And recently I was actually talking with a friend about the winter solstice and the Celtic festival of Samhain when she asked me how the Norse or the Vikings might have celebrated this time of year. It's a brilliant question and I'll do my best to answer it well and I think it makes for an excellent episode one. Growing up I always had a real interest in lots of different mythologies and Samhain was one that always caught my imagination so I guess we'll talk a little bit about this festival before we move on to the Norse tradition that is associated with this time of year. This Celtic pagan festival was traditionally celebrated between October 31st and the 1st of November at the sunrise of one day and the sunset of the next and it marked the passing of one year and the beginning of another. And during this time, livestock was brought in from the fields and any who wouldn't fare well over the winter were slaughtered for food. The Celts came together in large gatherings to feast during this festival and many ritual fires were lit and it's thought that people relit their own fires in their homes with a flame taken from the ritual bonfires. The idea being that the sacred flame would protect them and keep them warm throughout the winter. It was a time of great significance, as is reflected in Celtic legends and tales. Indeed, the legendary Tuatha de Danann were said to allow mortals into their realm during the Feast of Samhain, which leads us to a particularly interesting belief about Samhain and what is described as the veil between the worlds. It was believed that the boundary or veils between this world and the other world could be crossed and were at their thinnest during Samhain, allowing the spirits of the dead or magical beings into the mortal realm, and the mortals too would be able to see into and cross over to the other world. Those with second sight, or also known as seers, as well as heroes such as Finn McCool, could pass between the worlds while others caught glimpses of the realms of fairies, elves, spirits and giants. For the pagans, this was not a time of fear or sadness. Death and dying were seen as a natural part of life, and Samhain was a time to honour and show their respect for those who had passed on. The spirits of the dead were thought to revisit their homes at this time, and offerings of food or drink were left outside to welcome them in once more. Many modern pagans still follow this belief, and that this is a time of change, and to gather together to celebrate the cycle of life and death, and to honour their ancestors. And so this naturally leads me on, I guess, to talk about what was known as the blot. The Norse are said to have observed a ritual known as the blot, and there are references to this practice in the sagas and poems, which I'll get to mentioning. But first, what was the blot? Well, the blot was a type of ritual sacrifice, when animals, crops, and in some cases humans, were offered to the gods, dead kinsmen or ancestors, and spirits of nature. The Vikings are thought to have worshipped the gods at ancient sites, groves, mounds or islands, usually in the open air. However, they would also come together in what was described as wooden temples containing carvings of various gods and deities. The idea of sacrificing life to gain good favour with another entity isn't a concept most of us would feel at ease with in the present day. But it's important to remember that this was a time when people had a strong belief in their gods, and gaining their favour was all important if one was to do battle, venture on a journey, build a new home. They would need the guidance and protection of the gods. It was, in fact, crucial. And so the blob was a way to honour the gods, to gain their goodwill, and for chieftains to demonstrate their wealth or power by providing all of the food and drink for the feast. And often the blot was actually led by the chieftain or a goda, which was a type of pagan priest. The four times of year when a blot was usually held included the winter solstice, spring equinox, summer solstice and the autumn equinox. But it could also be held if there was a bad harvest, for example, or a crisis in which the people sought the god's intervention. In the 13th century, Snorri Sturluson wrote a detailed description of a blot that was held by Sigurd Hakenson in the saga of Hakon the Good. Sigurd is described as making many sacrifices as his one father had, and that it was commonplace for the farmers from the area to gather at a temple to sacrifice. During the celebrations, all who attended were given food and drink. Many animals were sacrificed, though mainly horses, and the blood was collected in sacrificial bowls, and that was splattered onto the walls and participants with the use of twigs. 
The meat from the sacrificed animals, having been boiled in large cauldrons that were hung over a fire in the hall, was then cooked and eaten. The good or the priest then blessed the meat and the ale as it was carried around the fire. Toasts were made in honour of Odin, Njord and Freyr, and their ancestors in the hope of a peaceful and prosperous time ahead. Oaths were made to fight well in battle, and then finally a toast honouring the dead who rested in their burial mounds. Sigurd Hackinson was regarded as a generous man who supplied everything for the feast and was well remembered for this. And so the blot ritual was a way in which the Vikings or the Norse exchanged a sacrifice in return for goodwill regarding weather, fertility, luck in battle. And there were various forms of this ritual. It could be a large gathering or, alternatively, a smaller, more private affair, um, one that might be held by farmers on their land, for example. Eventually, with the introduction of Christianity, blot feasts lost much of their significance. Winter nights, or vetinator, and I do sincerely apologise if my pronunciation is completely shocking there. Anyway, it was said to last three days and was held to mark the end of the summer, the beginning of the winter and the start of a new year. During this time in pre-Christian Scandinavia, there were blots called the Alpha Blot and Disa Blot. Disa Blot was a celebration of the Disir, and they were benevolent female deities, and they were associated with fate and the harvest. The Disir are such a fascinating subject, and I'm going to explore that um, a little bit more in another episode, but they were understood to be the goddesses associated with fate, a family or an individual, or even a place, and who were the object of worship with sacrifices called Disablot being made to them. They were also associated with the Norns' fate and Valkyries, two more really interesting topics to talk about. Alphablot was the ritual sacrifice in honour of the Alfar, or Elves, this sacrifice was a celebration that took place on the homesteads and organised by the women of the home. The Alpha Blot was a rare occasion when strangers were not welcomed into the household, and that's something that goes against the customary tradition at the time. Elves in Norse mythology are mentioned occasionally and described as beings who are more beautiful than the sun. They are sometimes hard to distinguish from other beings such as gods, giants, spirits of nature or the land. However, they are described as resembling humans but with magical and otherworldly powers, such as having the power to heal, and alternatively, they were also able to cause harm. An example of a sacrifice to the elves in order to heal a wind can actually be seen in Cormac's saga, when Thorvard, who has been injured and is making a slow recovery, seeks advice from Thordis, who replies, A hill there is, answered she, not far away from here where the elves have their haunt. Now get you the bull that Cormac killed, and redden the outer side of the hill with its blood, and make a feast for the elves with its flesh, then thou wilt be healed. An interesting part of Norse mythology is that some elves are the souls of dead humans, and that they are connected to the burial mounds of the dead. But it's unclear if this was a place that they dwell, or simply just a sacred place to both mortals and elves alike, and this ties in with the alphablot ritual of honouring the deceased ancestors. The Light Elves are described as dwelling in the realm of Alfheim, in the highest level of Yggdrasil, near the realms of Asgard, home of Odin and the Aesir, and Vanaheim, the home of the fertility gods, the Vanir. Frey Vanir and fertility god is the ruler of Alfheim, and one of the gods worshipped in the Alphablot. When I was researching this topic, I came across an interesting description of elves, and it reads, Many of the elves were supposed to live and die with the trees and plants which they tended, but these moss, wood or tree maidens, while remarkably beautiful when seen in front, were hollow like a trough when viewed from behind. They appear in many of the popular tales, but almost always as benevolent and helpful spirits, for they were anxious to do good to mortals and to cultivate friend friendly relations with them. In Icelandic and Faroese folklore, the Hulda folk, or the hidden people, is the name given to the elves. But most of the time they are invisible to our eyes, they are still said to resemble humans and are usually peaceable when their homes are left undisturbed and respected by mortals. They live in the rocks, hillocks or mounds on the land and this is a good example of how elves are perceived as land spirits and there are many wonderful folklore tales and some of which I'll get to in later episodes. In essence, the Alpha Blot was a ritual celebration honouring the gods Odin and Frey, the elves and dead ancestors. But the Alpha Blot is a ritual where the, where the actual practices aren't that well known, and it would appear to be more private an occasion than the Disa Blot when large gatherings were drawn together. An example of the Alpha Blot being regarded as a more secretive affair is in the poem Ustafara Visir 
by the Icelandic skald Sigvat Thorthorsson. And this was written while he was travelling in Sweden sometime around the year 1019. Thorthorsson tells how, after a long journey, he and his men sought a place to rest, and fully expected to be housed for the night according to the rules of hospitality. They were, however, turned away from the first homestead after being told it was a hallowed place, and two further dwellings after that. Upon arriving at the last homestead, he met a woman who told him it was the time of Alphablot, and a stanza from the poem reads... Do not come any farther in, wretched fellow, said the woman. I fear the wrath of Odin. We are heathen. The disagreeable female who drove me away like a wolf without hesitation said they were holding a sacrifice to the elves inside her farmhouse. Secrecy about a rite or ritual does tend to conjure up many ideas within our imaginations, but from this I tend to be drawn more to the connections between the gods, nature, land spirits and how fragile human life can be. A poor harvest and people might starve. Treacherous storms and irreparable damage could be wrecked upon the land, homes and seafaring vessels, and illness or disease could prove to be fatal. It is clear the ancients had a strong belief system and valued what they received from the gods because of their sacrifices. Sawain and the Alpha Blot do have common themes, and is one of the reasons I find mythology so interesting, and that is the parallels between cultures, beliefs or mythologies. Both festivals or rituals occur as the winter approaches, they observe or commemorate the deceased and those who have passed on to the other world. Sacrifices to the gods, spirits or ancestors are made in the hope and desire for a winter that is both kind to man and beast. Gods and spirits are found in the land, sea, earth, sky, sun and moon. It really is just quite fascinating. At the end of each episode, I'll try and include a piece of mythology, legend or folklore, and today I think I found something that's rather special and relevant to include here. Um, it comes from Alvismal, or the Lay of Alvis, and it tells the story of the dark elf, or dwarf, called Alvis, who comes to claim Thor's daughter Thrud as his bride. Things really do get off to a bit of a rocky start, though. Um, Alvis, I wouldn't say, is terribly well um, received. And Thor asks of Alvis, What are you? Why is your nose so pale? Do you sleep in a grave mound and keep the corpses company? And he refuses his daughter's hand in marriage. Alvis then tells Thor that there is nothing he does not know, that he lives under a hill in a cavern hewn out of rock, and he insists on having Thrud as his bride. Thor then tells Alvis that he must correctly answer all of his questions in order to win the hand of his daughter. I'm going to condense the questions and answers a little bit, but I would wholeheartedly urge listeners to read this myth in its entirety. It really is pretty fantastic. Um, so Thor demands that Alvis answers whatever he might ask about all the worlds, and it begins each question by saying, Tell me, Alvis, the dwarf who knows everything about our fates and fortunes. And then the questioning begins. What is the name for the land that stretches all around us? Alvis replied, Men call it Earth, the elves call it Grower. And what is the name for the sky? Alvis replied, Men call it Heaven, the gods say Height, and the elves call it Fair Roof. And what is the name for the moon? Alvis replied, Gods say Mock Sun, and Hell it is Whirling Wheel, and the elves call it Time Teller. Thor then asked, And what is the name of the sun? Alvis replied, The dwarves call it Valen's Light, the giants call it Everbright, and the elves call it Fair Wheel. And what is the name for the clouds? To which Alvis replied, The Vanir say Wind Kites, and Hell they are the helmets of secret, and elves call them Weathermite. And what is the name for seed sown by men in each and every world? Alvis replied, Men call it Barley, the gods say grain, the Vanir say growth, and the giants call it edible. In hell it is slender stem, and the elves call it drink grist. But the tale has a rather sad ending. For all of the knowledge that Alvis possesses, he does not win the hand of Thrud. Instead, he's delayed by answering all of Thor's questions, and is turned into stone by the first rays of the morning sun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast.
I would just like to add, I have a little special folklore episode that I'm going to upload. Um, I recorded it around about Halloween and it's fantastic little stories that I found from across Scandinavia. And at the end of this episode, I'm going to have a massive shout out to everybody who's been absolutely wonderful to me. I just have a huge big thank you to say to all of them. Um, definitely try and tune in. You might hear your name. Once again, thank you very much for listening. I'm Siobhan Clark and this has been the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast.